away from home on ministry and travels, I do not consider myself to have been a good father. Mm. But by God's grace, uh, you know, we have had a very good relationship and friendship with all the four daughters and uh, uh, God enlightened their minds right from their younger days and they could also grow up to, you know, truly... And, and one of them is in ministry. Love the Lord and one of them is in ministry. That is right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you have a great impact in their life as well, isn't it? That is what uh, they say. Yeah. But I did not deliberately do anything to make an impact as such. But as I was serving the Lord, it pleased the Lord to, you know, influence them uh, through me. There's a proverb in English which I hate. It's a, it says, behind every successful man, there's a woman. It shouldn't be behind. It should be beside, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think we had to rephrase that uh, proverb. That's beside right. every successful man, there is a woman. The woman in your life, Mrs. Betty Kurian, I'm sure she has a great influence and impact in your life. Today, what evangelist John Kurian is, because of you know a lady by the name uh, Betty Kurian, would you say something about your wife? Yes. Uh, uh, what you said is absolutely true. I say amen to it. Uh, one thing uh, that I can look back and uh, thank God for is the fact that I married uh, at the center of God's will. What were you looking for in a woman uh, when, you, when you want to get married? Uh, actually, all that I was looking for was a person whom God had prepared for me. That was the only thing in my mind. Yeah, but then how do, how do we know it? Yeah. One with a real spiritual commitment, mm -hmm. one who can stand with me as I set out to serve the Lord. You know, I was married even before I became a so-called full-time worker. Mm. I was married when I did not have a job, so to say. Mm. I had returned from Doha and I had not joined the prison fellowship. It was in between at that time. Mm. So, But I knew that God was leading me to make the decision of serving the Lord full-time. So I shared it with my wife and I asked her whether if she was ready for such a life. And she said, if the Lord gives me grace, I will be uh, happy to join you in that. So that is one thing that I'm very happy about, that I sought the mind of the Lord in marriage and I married the right person whom God had prepared for me. Maybe we should, uh, you know, for the sake of our listeners, we should answer this question what you should look for in a spouse, whether in a boy or a girl. So what would be some of those uh, tips? Yeah, some of the criteria I think should be, number one, uh, spiritual qualification. Of course. Someone who is born again, mm -hmm. who knows the Lord, and who shares your vision and your commitment. That's important, I guess. That's very important, because if you have a vision about life, about purpose of life and what you want to achieve in life, and if your spouse is uh, uh, not willing to travel along the same line, mm -hmm. your life will be very miserable. Yes. So I think that is the primary thing that we should be looking for when we consider marriage. Mm. Then, of course, uh, you, you should be, uh, the, uh, she should be a person with whom you, you can meaningfully communicate. Mm. You know, though the educational level and all are not very important. But, you know, it should be a person, she should be a person with whom you can reasonably communicate and uh, uh, she should be able to communicate with you. Mm. That is something very, very important. So someone who is willing to share your burden and someone who is willing to share your vision and commitment, I think that's the most important thing that we should be looking for. Mm. And, uh, you know, there are so many other factors, but when you really pray, and uh, look only for that person whom God has prepared for you. What are the common wrong trends today in looking for a spouse? Well, uh, I mean, you have you have been with a lot of youngsters, and you have been repairing a lot of married lives, and you come across you know people who end up in married life because they had wrong priorities in life. Yeah, I think the wrong perspective on life that itself is the greatest problem. Okay, you know, many people they just want to make money. They want to go abroad. They want to, you know, become big in this world. And successful. Successful. Mm -hmm. That's the primary thing in life. Mm. And then they look for someone who would help them to achieve that. Mm. You know, someone 
a highly educated or someone with a particular profession and things like that. So the the spiritual criteria are not given mm. uh, uh, importance. Mm. I think that is one mistake that we make today. So when young people uh, are considering marriage, what they should be looking for is not, uh, you know, people from a particular profession or, you know, not beauty or other things. They are all secondary. Mm. Of course, the person you, you marry should be attractive in your eyes. There is no doubt about it. Mm. But that should not be the primary criteria. The mm. primary criteria should be, will she be a help for me in achieving my goal in life? Mm. And our goal as Christians, we, we have only one goal, mm. to please the Lord. Yeah. So will she or he, mm. you know, for a girl, stand with me to accomplish in this that. goal in fulfilling mm -hmm. this uh, goal in my life. So if you make that your uh, aim, I think the Lord will definitely help you and lead you along the right path because your heart is set on him. And then I'm sure he will definitely uh, lead you yeah. uh, in, the in the right direction. There's one verse that I always give to young people, Psalm 25 verse 12. Who is he that fears the Lord? Mm. Him shall he show the way mm. that he should choose. Mm. So I always say, if you truly fear the Lord and say, Lord, I just want to please you by my life. If that is your commitment, then the Lord will show you which way to choose even in the matter of marriage. So I fully believe that. I proved that in my own life. And uh, I guarantee that that will work in the life of any young person. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that that's one of the reasons why your one of your daughters got married from a different culture, from Andhra Pradesh. That's right. Because language is not a preference. That's right. You know, because she was she was looking for a godly man, and she found in him. Now, coming back to your wife, how did you finally decide that this is the girl that God has planned for my life? Uh, before going to see her for the first time. I had waited upon the Lord and prayed that when I go and see that girl, somehow I must know in my heart that this is the person. I mean, or, you should have a peace of mind. Yes, absolute peace of mind. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what happened when I went and saw her and spent a few minutes talking to her. Uh, this, uh, you know, peace of mind uh, came into my heart and I was fully settled in my heart that this is the person I think. It was God who gave that because I was not looking at anything else, money or mm -hmm. beauty or hairstyle or anything. That was not in my mind at all. Mm -hmm. All that I wanted is a person who is godly, who is spiritual and who would stand with me. Because I went with that intention and intense prayer. I had prayed, uh, I think, quite a lot about it. And when I went and saw the girl and talked to her, uh, I was totally at rest in my heart. So... Uh, that is something that I can still look back and I've never questioned that that thought again. Now, you being away from the family, because you are an itinerary evangelist, you have to stay, you know, weeks together in different places, from one place to another place, and your wife was taking care of all, all four daughters. What was uh, her role in building your family as a mother? Yo, her role was very, very vital. Without her support, nothing could have happened. And, uh, you know, God gave me a very able wife. She is quite intelligent, highly educated, and she is very able. God has given her the ability to manage things at home, even when uh, I was not there. Even when you are there, I think she manages a lot of household things like... Uh you know, buying things or, you know, all the home affairs. Yeah. Because she will give you more time for studies, that prayer right. preparation and stuff like that. She gives me maximum st time to study. Yeah. Of course, I also do, you know, shopping and buying and all that, but that to a minimum. Very minimum. Mm -hmm. Whatever she can do, she herself does that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I also do. Mm -hmm. But uh, she always wants me to set apart more time for reading and, you know, studying and ministry. Mm -hmm. So she was very, very uh, supportive. God gave her the ability to manage things. And she was uh, very supportive of, uh, of the ministry that uh, uh, God had given me. I so, mean, she was supportive uh, as a wife, right? Right. But how would you assess her as a mother? Like being a good mother, what did you 
find in her something unique. Yeah. Uh, because you were away most of the time. That's right. Yeah. She was a school teacher. She was teaching in Kunur and then uh, when I married her, mm -hmm. then uh, she taught in Kotayam also for a short time. And uh, we had already come to this understanding that once we have children, mm. uh, she will not work. Mm. So uh, later she resigned a job when we had children. And then she has never gone back to a job, though there were a lot of possibilities for her to go back. Mm -hmm. So the advantage was that she was always av available to the children at home. Mm -hmm. Even when I was not available, as I said earlier, I, I, I feel guilty sometimes that I have not spent as much time as I should have spent with them. But my wife was always available at home in helping them spiritually, in counseling them, and also helping them with their studies mm -hmm. and their extracurricular act activities. So that was the greatest advantage that we got because she left her uh, uh, secular job. Uh, you know, you talked about how she is helpful in giving you time for your private studies, prayer, preparation, etc. How she is a spiritual influence for you? What, what spiritual quality of hers influenced you? Yeah, her, uh, there are several qualities, I must say. One is, she has a large... Because this is something that you, you will not use as illustration in your sermons. I Therefore, know. I have to ask you. That is right, yeah. <laughs> she has a large heart for people. Okay. People in need. Mm -hmm. in a, people, people who need to be helped. Even sometimes I have felt, why is she going out of her way to help them? Mm. Even I have felt like that. But she has a large heart for people who are poor, who are, who are needy. So in that way... Uh, I have really appreciated her willingness to help people. Also, people uh, in the household, you know, uh, like uh, my mother was with me for some time and now my sister is with me and my younger sister who was uh, down with cancer was with us. So she had absolutely no problem in taking care of them. She was able to do that. God had given her the ability and she was willing to do that. That's a great quality that I found in her that she was willing to go out of her way to help people, not only those who are outside our, our family circle, even people in our own families. She, she was willing to help them and care for them and uh, take care of them. So you, that's a great quality. Your daughters have told me that she's, a, she's kind of a link that connects all the extended family, <laughs> that she makes sure that, you know, all the family members are connected together. That is They're right. in conversation and, you know, uh, they get updates from each other and she keeps the family vibe going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're, they're, my children are right in saying that. Yeah. 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 So uh, how you have influenced some, some people? I know people like uh, George Koshi or, um, you know, Roy Matthews from Doha or Vinoji Abraham, I mean, Vinoji Samuel in the U.S. and also uh, Jibu, Philip K. Andrews or Brown, you know, these people have told me personally that you have impacted their lives. Could you share some of your experience with those people? Yeah. I'm just picking some, okay? Uh, uh, and also there's one brother, Robert, in your, in your assembly, uh, whom yeah. you are very close to. That's right, yeah. yeah. I think I have not done uh, anything deliberately to influence them. Yeah, but they would say, yeah, uh, brother John, John Korean had a that's big right. role to play in yeah. our life. Yeah, uh, I've maintained good friendship with them. That's uh, number one, you know, mm -hmm. cracking jokes with them, traveling with them, spending... Oh, people do not know that you crack jokes, by the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Are you humorous by... Uh... Uh, actually, only if I get close to people. Okay, uh, I know. Not, not <laughs> with strangers. Yes, not with strangers, yeah, yeah. Now, people okay. think humor is something bad. I think it's part of our life, right? Yeah, there is bad humor also. <laughs> <but> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, I don't think I've done anything deliberately to influence them, but mm. my friendship with them, time spent with them, travels, you know, we have uh, all these, most of these people, we have traveled together to different places. And uh, whenever I have, uh, uh, God gave me an opportunity to share some spiritual truths with these people, I have done that, you know, mm. that may have uh, helped them, uh, I believe. And about uh, Vinoji Samuel, especially, you know, when I returned from my Af first African trip, I shared about the ministry in Africa. And uh, I cannot say I influenced him, but the Lord himself gave him a burden about Africa. And that's how he left Kotem for Africa. So mm -hmm. that was a great 
impact. Mm. Uh, I cannot say I made in his life, but my my trip or my mission uh, work, you know, did in his life. Yes. Yeah, uh, but the George Koshi in a personal conversation told me that uh, in his young age, you spent a day with him, and he thought he's writing songs and he's actively participating in all the programs of the church. But you told him very specifically that activity is not spirituality, and therefore you have to consider discipleship seriously. So that he said that was a turning point in his life. So what is your take on discipleship? Yeah, I personally believe that, uh, as uh, uh, George Goshi shared, activity in itself is not spirituality. Mm. So I try to share this thought with people that mm. it is a personal, intimate walk with God in your daily life mm. that makes you spiritual. So a disciple is one who learns from the master. It is not just one who works for the master. It is true the disciple may work for the master, but basically a disciple is a follower, one who follows the master. So a true Christian disciple is one who follows the Lord Jesus in his day-to-day -day life and learn his character and grow into his likeness. So I always try to emphasize this aspect in my preaching and in my you know, personal talk with people, how important it is mm. to walk in intimate fellowship with God every day of our life and grow into the likeness of Christ in our character. I believe that is the essence of spirituality. See, when you talk about spirituality, there's a very interesting observation. You know, I classify people into three groups. The first group thinks that seriousness is spirituality. You know, right. <laughs> be serious, don't talk to people, don't cut any joke, don't even smile, you know. Right. Be always uh, very uh, serious. And that's equal to spirituality. And some other people think being silent is spirituality. Maybe during the Middle Ages, there were people, you know, spending time in caves and not connected with the rest of the world. Right. You know, be silent and, you know, close your eyes, be in the sight of God and you'll get closer to God automatically. And the third category is, of course, screaming and shouting, you know. Round the clock, your hand should be in the air and you should shout hallelujah. Activity. Activity, yeah. So how do you bring in balance about a right definition of spirituality? I think a, a spiritual person is a normal human being. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It is not uh, being very vociferous or mm. not being uh, very uh, serious mm -hmm. or not being silent. Mm. You just be who you are. Be you natural. Know? Be natural. Mm -hmm. So, just be a normal person and uh, involved in normal daily activities of life. Mm. So, according to the uh, ability God has given you, get involved in spiritual activities and day-to-day -day things of life. But it is uh, the condition of your heart, you know, how intimately you walk with God in your day-to-day -day life and how clean you keep yourself from all defilements of the world in prayer and meditation of God's word and in personal communion with God. I think that is the essence of spirituality. Mm. So by nature, some people may be uh, like, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, very vociferous. They may talk quite a lot mm. and some people may be reserved. Mm. But I think that has nothing to do with spirituality. So, the, and you know, some people think, you know, going to church and giving money and, you know, singing songs or, you know, doing the prayers. That's right. Yeah. That is activity oriented yeah, spirituality. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But uh, that and is, that's measurable also, you know. That is right. Yeah. That is not what the scripture teaches. The condition of our heart, mm. you know, in Psalm 51, when David prayed that prayer, he said, Lord, you seek truth in the inward parts. Mm. And the word of God clearly says, man looks at the outside, God, is looking God at the heart. looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. So the condition of your heart... Mm. In, uh, Whether it is tuned with God. That's right. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter 2, when the Lord wrote that letter to the church in Ephesus, the Lord said, I appreciate your doctrinal understanding, your activity, but I have something against you. You have left your first love. That mm -hmm. means the condition of your heart. Mm -hmm. So the condition of your heart is more important than the activity of your hand. Mm -hmm. So that is something that people should realize. That is what spirituality is all about. Well, in other words, you... uh, it, it, you know, spirituality is not churchianity. No, yeah. no. It's yeah. totally, to totally different. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you look at the church in general, 
what has happened to our churches i think one major problem with present day christianity is the present day christianity does not affect your life hmm. you know as you read in second timothy chapter 3 one of the marks of the end times is form of godliness without its power hmm. Hmm. i believe that power is the power to transform lives true godliness will always have the power to change your life transform mm. your life mm. so the greatest problem with present day churchianity or christianity is there is a sort of christianity that does not affect your life mm. that is fake that mm. is what we understand from that verse mm-hmm. form of godliness is there mm. but it doesn't change your life mm-hmm. so a christianity that transforms your life that influences your character mm. is the right kind of christianity according to the word of god so uh that is what should be emphasized today it is not just doctrine but doctrine plus practical life that makes a true christian not just what you believe but whether you practice what you believe mm. not that we are uh, we need to become you know uh, perfect that's not possible god doesn't expect us to be per- perfect overnight yeah. but god wants us to be honest all the time so in our day to day life put into practice what you believe and what you preach and in the areas of your failure you confess it to god you cry out for grace and god's help and with god's help you can have a developing christian character that's an ongoing process in our our christian life so the present day problem with christianity and with the churches is that you know we profess a lot and we fail to put those things into Practice. practice christianity that does not affect our daily lives mm-hmm. i think in my estimate that's a greatest problem today i think that's a great point that you have raised uh, you have been to maybe over 30 countries and interacted with people of different cultures worship with uh, different language group and cultural groups and you have seen how what is christian life in different parts of the globe yes and in comparison to those assemblies do we have anything to pick and choose from them saying that hey that's good maybe we should adapt this or there this particular practice is good or we do something differently maybe we should adapt that is there anything that you have come across yeah i found uh, many good things in uh, the lives of believers in 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 other countries see some of the countries uh, where i've been like korea and japan uh, one thing that i've noticed there that the 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 elders a very very responsible they love the church and some of them stay overnight saturday in the church mm. uh, to prepare themselves for the next day mm-hmm. uh, you know to, to prepare the teaching or the message so they take church very seriously mm. it is not like a side business or a okay. you know, little bit of time that you give to your church on sunday no mm-hmm. that is one thing that i have noticed in some of those countries many of the elders are really really serious about their church they are really concerned about so do they treat it like a, the church okay do they treat it like a full time job yeah many of them do and some of them even if it is not full time they try somehow try to give make more time, time. Yeah, more time give for... more time mm-hmm. you yeah, that is one good thing that i have uh, seen in those assemblies another good thing that i have seen in uh, some of the churches abroad uh they take care of their evangelists or what we call full time workers very well mm. so i mean in terms of their material needs as well that is right material okay. that is what i primarily meant mm-hmm. material needs so they think that if we are living uh at this standard of life you know the ordinary people in the church mm-hmm. our evangelist or uh, also should live the same way that is their kind of thinking if that's we a, have a that's car that's a fabulous philosophy yes if we have a car They should. They, they should also have a car mm-hmm. it is not that because he is an evangelist he should uh, just use a cycle only mm-hmm. they don't think like that mm-hmm. so they support their missionaries abroad or local evangelists mm. uh, uh, in a very very good way so that these evangelists they are not worried about how they will pay their uh, children's fees or how they will buy milk they are not worried about that they, they can f- concentrate more on ministry yes, side they focus on the ministry because the church is behind them supporting them taking care of their needs mm-hmm. that is one very good thing that i have found mm-hmm. then uh, another good thing that i found in some of the assemblies uh, you know during their worship uh, service as we say 
Well, they believe and practice almost the same things that we do in India, mm -hmm. because we all believe the same thing. There are some cultural differences, that's all. But many in many churches, a uh, good number of people take active role in praising God. For example, Open in the worship, worship. Co common worship. Mm -hmm. So it is not so much preaching on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a few may read a passage or share a word in a very brief way, but they focus more on audibly praising God. Mm -hmm. So there is a spirit of worship and praise there. Mm -hmm. So very often I found in the Indian churches, it is more preaching about worship rather than worshiping. I think that's because we believe in preacherhood of all believers. Yeah, that, than, than the priesthood of all believers. <laughs> yeah, that is one good thing uh, I, I have found in some of the churches uh, abroad. So, so and I'm sure they're also things. very serious in giving, isn't it, as a yeah, church? Yeah, many, many, in many places, they're very, very serious in giving. They, they in supporting the work, and also the all work. the programs of the church, whether it is a Sunday school or a Bible study, or uh, you know, preaching. It's all very systematic, well regular, organized, well organized. Well organized. Yeah. They plan things very much in advance. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So it's not like uh, their Sunday school is not just coloring and crafting. <laughs> it's more than that, like learning the word that's systematically. Right. That's right. I yeah. mean, that's why there's a, you know, strength and growth. You know, unfortunately, in our culture, I think uh, we think number is strength or success or, you know, growth. But every growth is not healthy. Like cancer is also growth, but it's not healthy. Yeah. So in your... Uh, you know, opinion, what is a healthy church? And what is your dream about a healthy church? Yeah. Uh, some of the factors about a healthy church is, see, I'm not against numbers. We want numbers. We yeah. are not that, we, we, we don't say minor, uh, small numbers are always good. Mm. We want numbers. Yeah. But about a healthy church, when we talk about numbers, there should be quality. Mm. The, we are not against quantity, but Quantity should be matched with quality. Mm. So people who are serious about their spiritual life, who lead a holy life, you know, I think that is one basic criteria about believers. People live holy lives mm. and they are serious about their spiritual life and they have a commitment to their, their local assembly. And a church where people love one another and care for one another. Mm. A church where the elders take good care of the flock mm. and where the flock honor and respect the elders. Mm. So these are some of the things, you know, that I can think about a healthy church. And I have seen this working in, in some other countries in the world. Mm. In India also, there may be a, a few churches like this, but in many other countries, some other countries, I've seen this uh, really practically working. So it was good if we could also come up to, the, uh, to, to that level and that standard. Very good. Many preachers, they don't address issues that are relevant to sisters. Hmm. I think the preachers and teachers should explain that to sisters that they also have a great role in the building of the Church of God. So I try to read what they have written and uh, try to uh, learn the meaning of those words, any special word used there, and then try to get the message. What is God trying to communicate through this passage?